Nine was always a script that we very much enjoyed because it's a thriller, it's a race against time. Finally, the king is dead, and now what? He told me you wish for Egon to be king. We're getting into a new territory here where we're standing right on the brink of war. We saw this episode as a real kind of Hitchcockian suspense film. Everything explodes and Alicent and Otto try to control the situation. So they get everyone and go into the small council chamber and try and work out what to do. Well, at least that's what Alison thinks. Alison's horrified because she realizes not only is her husband dead and she has to process that, but secretly her council has been plotting for this very day to come so that they can overthrow Rhaenyra and install Aegon, her son, on the throne, which is the thing that she's wanted, but she didn't want to do it through dastardly deeds. It's a good departure for her because she's seeing maybe this isn't the father she knew as she was growing up, but certainly this is the man that he now is. I will not have this. To hear that you are plotting to replace the king's chosen heir. We liked the idea that Beesbury was an honorable man at his core and a you know, real fan of Viserys. And he seems to be this kind of doddering old man who's losing his grip a bit on his faculties. But then we love that he makes this final triumphant last stand and calls everybody in the room a liar and a traitor and then, and then dies for it, but goes out in a very unexpected, but I think honorable way. Season one is quite an internal story about the dissolution of a family and therefore we don't really get out much and once we're out there you know we really felt we wanted to make the most of it. Otto Hightower decided they need to murder Rhaenyra and Damon and their whole family so as not to have an opposition. Alicent refuses to let that happen and it sets off this race for both of them to find Aegon because each of them wants to influence him. Where is Aegon? Not here. Otto sends the Cargill twins, Sir Eric and Sir Arik. Allison goes to Cole, her loyal bulldog, who grabs Aemond as a partner and sends them out into the streets, knowing that Aemond knows what, what Aegon has been up to in the streets of King's Landing. And I think that's the big mystery of the episode is, who is Aegon really? Who is this man we're about to make king? You tolerated the prince's proclivities for years. We swore an oath of service until death. Over the course of episode nine, Eric and Arik uh, show us that they are not in sync, particularly when it comes to Aegon as a worthy king, whereas Arik is okay with following orders. Eric feels more and more that his brother is lost. And during the capture of Egon, Eric doesn't do anything. He allows his brother to fight Chris and Cole, but he doesn't intervene in any way, shape, or form, and then disappears. When Egon and Eamon have that fight, we really wanted to make it into like a sibling hatred, and Tom really dug deep and wanted to create this really tormented character versus Eamon, who is tormented, but he keeps it all hidden and under the surface. I have no wish to rule. I'm not suited. You get no argument from me. <laughs> There's a lot of bitterness from Eamon's side. He's built to be the king. He's, he wants the responsibility. He thinks he'd be good at it. And Aegon being the eldest son, it falls to him to do it. Aegon is an unlikely and unwilling king. He doesn't think his father ever really loved him enough or respected him enough to think that he was worthy of the job. And much like Damon, Aegon just wanted to know that Viserys loved him and thought him worthy. He'll never really get that because his father died before he could say anything. You love me. You imbecile. Aegon's coronation is another one of these show trials. The High Towers really do like their staged events. But the idea is that in order for Aegon to be accepted by the people, you have to put him in front of the people and show them that he's their king. So they put on this big, grand pomp ceremony, stick the conqueror's sword in his hand, put the conqueror's crown on him, and call him king in front of the people so that the people will accept that that is Aegon their king, not realizing that this is being done without the knowledge of Dragonstone. You know, the word hasn't even reached Dragonstone yet that Viserys is dead. So Rhaenys wakes up and realizes that she's a prisoner because should she get out, the fear is that she'll go straight to Rhaenyra and tell her what's going on. Eric Cargill, who's had enough of Aegon and does not want to see him become king, defects from the King's Guard and takes Rhaenys out of the castle with him, right in the midst of this big roundup to witness the coronation. We needed a penultimate scene, so we tried to come up with what's the worst thing that could possibly happen in the coronation and realized that it was a dragon to be let loose. Rhaenys, 
the Queen of Never Was. She's a triumphal dragon rider. We wanted a triumphal moment for her at the end of the season. We really wanted to make sure that there was meat on her character. Rainey's was not passive, and it felt this was an incredibly valuable moment to, rather than have her just bear witness to something, be able to take part in it, but her moral standpoint become the reason for, for inaction rather than action. She knows if she sets fire to that dais, she ends any possibility of war and probably sets peace throughout the realm. But I think probably doesn't want to be responsible for doing that to another mother. And that's a, it's, a, it's a complex choice and one that people might dispute or have a problem with. But that's the choice Rhaenys makes in that moment. We see her busting out and being the one that's going to take the news to Dragonstone of the coup and of Rhaenyra's throne being stolen. And it's a great, you know, great heroic moment for her character.